Welcome to the Mock Stars Podcast. My name is Evan Kunai. I am one of your hosts, and we are here with the return of Christopher Ritter. Keep the robot your body, Evan. Is that a, the robot's name? Yeah, a Pate. It's Pate. Pate. Yeah. P- well, P8. regardless. We're here. And and Pate is we're alongside here. of us. He's always present, you know, just whether or not he makes an appearance. Better not Joe's face around here. No, no. Dude, you better watch out. Pate is always listening. Did you catch that? Did you hear Pate? Oh, I heard him. Oh. I heard him. Well, this is the number one podcast. louder than that on the mic. <laughs> He's... He's listening, Ritter. Well, this is the number one podcast on the internet for Magic the Gathering and Dr. Pepper, the home of the mid-range mindset. We are the Mox Stars. And if you'd like to support the show, you can do so by finding us on YouTube. If you're watching us on YouTube right now, you can see our YouTube page. You can see that we have just hit 139 subscribers. Thank you all for your support. You can also find us on all major podcasting platforms where you can leave us five stars and make us look super duper cool, but not as cool as the shirt I'm wearing, which is a tie-dye shirt of a cat falling and and screaming. It's, like, ah, it's a spiral tie-dye. Anyway, it looks really cool. Uh, and if you'd like to continue, if you'd like to support the show even further, you can find us on Patreon, where you can become a supporter for $3 a month, become an official pepperhead, or you can become a cherry vanilla pepperhead like UWP Quirt. For $5 a month, uh, you get not... Okay, so we do giveaways bi-weekly, and as a super supporter like UWP Quirt, you get two free entries into every single one of our giveaways and if you are a standard pepperhead you get one free giveaway uh, entry this week's giveaway for all you pepperheads and non-pepperheads out there is a dan frazier arcane signet uh the, the it is the oh i'm spacing right now on the type of foiling this is do you remember that uh the texture foil um uh, no, you're and I since I can't I don't have the live video since I'm here uh, contemporaneous to you. Uh, what which arcane signet? It's the one that was the promo. It was from Magicon. No, it was only in the secret layers. So the Dan, no, it's yeah. the one that matches his other uh, signets and whatnot, yes, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So arcane signet. Uh, I don't know retro. Retro foiling, maybe. There's so many foils wasn't that, wasn't out there. The, but wasn't that con- the conceit of the all the Dan Fraser ones that they use the retro foiling because they have the retro styling? They did, yeah. Or they am used, I wrong about that? They, okay. They did retro foiling, but it's like textured on the front. I, why am I spacing on it? I feel like such a ding dong. Uh, anyway, you getting? Whoa, whoa, whoa! Cut the harsh language, man. I shouldn't be so hard on myself, should I? D word, D word. Come on. <laughs> I'm better than that. You're right. Uh, Kids listen to am this. I? Am I though? Uh, not only will you get this Dan Frazier Arcane Signets. Someone correct me with the type of foiling. There are 900 types of foilings now. I feel like so. Uh, I don't feel that bad. I mean, about. you wished for this, didn't you? You were always talking about oh, like oh, all the great foiling that the Pokemon cards have. Blah blah blah. And, and DBZ, Digimon, and yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yes. Wizards heard you and they're like, well, we could cash in on this, couldn't we? You know, you, and now you got now you got all all the everything you would want. Yeah, maybe it's a little, some just desserts here. Uh but you're also gonna get a one of a kind Cora Labs Mock Stars can cap with our logo on it. Uh these are literally one of ones. I have uh four of them, uh, but this is the one in the giveaway uh and so each one is a different design so uh yes that's what you can uh potentially win by becoming a patron you can also enter by following us on instagram and leaving a comment on the post that i'll put up uh when this show airs all right there's some big news in cdh happening today ritter and uh, this is first reported by Lamora's Cards, but uh, on Twitter, 
uh, or on X, I should say, at CEDHPT, they there was an announcement this week about a Wizards of the Coast contract that would allow them to host and uh, well, I'll just read uh, host CDH tournaments, but I'll just read the post um, and CDH. PT posts, in order to avoid further rumors and questions, please please read below. In early March, we were directly contacted by Wizards of the Coast regarding CDH and tournament organizing and requesting a meeting, most specifically the CDH European Championship for this year. How we put it together and how it worked. Wizards of the Coast offered support for prizing. Yes, you read that correctly. Due to restrictions that we will have to adopt and accept. Playtest cards will have to be left on the side. We declined the offer. Later on, we had a second meeting and we closed it with a start of an uh, with a start of agreement. When we think the time is right and the community is prepared for it, we will be hosting a solo event with the support Wizards of the Coast offered maybe next year. No matter what, having Wizards of the Coast contacting directly to offer support is something incredible for the format and a turning point for the future of competitive commander. CDH is here to stay. Thank you for all your support. This is big because uh, I think that these tournament organizers set the tone immediately to keep Wizards of the Coast in check on a couple things here, which is um, that Wizards of the Coast offered support, but only if the tournaments would not allow proxies. And they said, absolutely not. That means we, like, they would limit their player base immensely, and it would become pay to win, like, not play to win. So, uh, first, that's great. Second, this is gives me a lot of hope for for the future and growth of the format, um, and how these how these guys approach it and how they like how they offer how Wizards Ghost offers support and the contract and the deal that they work out will ultimately lay the foundation for how future tournaments are organized and um, in what sense you know like uh, some LGSs are supported by Wizards and, you know like given prize support and um, like play you know like game day promos and stuff like that I wonder what kind of support CDH uh, like tournaments would get uh, now that this is potentially on the table for for everybody, for all LGSs out there. Anyway, this is pretty big news, Ritter. I'm uh, it, I, I I sorry, sorry, my reaction wasn't big enough. Ah, can, it's big actually, news. Can, just just give me the log line from the top. Like I'm going to pretend that I'm just hearing about this. All right. Uh, well, Wizards of Coast is offering support for CDH tournaments today. Pretty much. What? 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 Hey, Madge. Madge, come in here. Come in here. I got news. <laughs> what? Can, can you re- can you repeat that? Yeah. So Wizards of the Coast is offering tournament support. Madge, Madge, are you listening? Are you listening, Madge? Matt, hold on. Madge is on the way in. Madge, Madge, get over here. We got news. We got big news. You got Madge. You got it, Madge. You got it here. All right, Madge is here. Can you repeat that? Yeah, so Wizards of the Coast is offering tournament support for CDH. It's crazy! What? what, what, what? Yeah, what? And so this means that the uh, the contracts that are potentially going to be placed moving forward would allow proxies, uh, and that's a huge step in the right direction for, uh, for Wizards of the Coast in acknowledging that the community is more important than profits. So uh, we'll see where it goes. That is that is the the biggest news of the day. Did Madge freak it, out appropriately? Huge news. I don't know who Madge uh, is. Well, you know Madge, <laughs> of course. My my oh. wife Madge. Oh, duh. <laughs> uh, anyway, yeah, no, uh, she freaked out. Yeah, she freaked, she jumped, appropriately. She jumped out the window. I don't know if you uh, like like a cartoon. Like literally, she just jumped through the window. It left a Madge size hole. Yeah, yeah, the body, the body shape. Yep. Yeah, yeah, no. I can imagine it's beautiful. All right. I mean, you hear news like that. How else do you react? If you are excited about the the potential for Wizards of the Coast uh, hosting, or well, supporting, not necessarily hosting, but working with tournament organizers in the future, let us know that level of excitement in the comments of the YouTube section. 
or in the YouTube se- comment section of on the YouTube channel on this video. Next, Ritter, I'm wondering, I'm really curious here uh, because we're we're hitting our stride as podcasters. We are 80 episodes in. We're rock stars. We're mock stars. And this is a question that I feel like uh, needs answered. Is a deck that focuses in on death by a thousand cuts fun to play or play against? And by that, I mean decks that are control based, but don't have any way to end the game outside of drawing. Well, not necessarily drawing the game, but, uh, other than dealing maybe, you know, two to four points of damage in any given turn cycle? Uh, well, to answer that question, uh, I played smallpox for many years. Uh, actually, I would say for 25 years, that is the type of play uh, that I played. Like, you know, I, I was on Necropotence from the jump and then all that, you know, all the sort of, uh, you know, resource denial stuff that goes with that. And then in modern, uh, playing, you know, that sort of Liliana Vale centric smallpox deck. Yeah. And, uh, you know, to answer your first question, uh, is that type of deck enjoyable, enjoyable to play? No. When <laughs> I, I don't know if I've described any of what I was doing playing magic as enjoyable, uh, <laughs> playing that deck. Uh, that being said, it was a strategy that um, I liked playing, uh, you know, and but the problem is, like, even in modern, like, it felt great ramping up to, you know, perfectly into a Liliana the Veil and just, cr- you know, controlling resources and hitting off your small poxes early and, you know, doing it asymmetrically and actually getting some sort of benefit off of it and all that sort of stuff. Um, but then actually winning the game was a grind. And, like, how do you close out the game? Like, it, like you would just... Ex- I was exploring so many bad options. Like, people would try to play, like, Tomb Stalker. Um, people would... The future site card, Tomb Stalker. Yeah. Um, the... Uh, Germag Angler, I think people would occasionally experiment with, and just like there was just never really a satisfying like, you know, way for that deck to close out. Like you know, pretty much you would just have to get them in a point where where your you know your trade offs, your one for ones were just slightly better, and then work that to a point where like they could not come back from the resource denial situation you had set up. Right. And I guess the the root of this question comes from another podcast that I was listening to where they express like pretty high level of disinterest in playing against this this type of deck. Like um, it's a bummer for everyone involved, even if you're winning. It's a bummer. Yeah, it's like uh, like uh, I would say like grave packed strategies where, you know, it's like you have a lock on the board so much so that uh, you're not allowed to like possess a creature for a meaningful period of time uh, or like for really you, you might have one instance of priority where you control that creature, but then it's gone. So well, I was, here's the thing. Like these, these decks don't put a hard lock on the game either. So it's just like, you have to play it out. Your opponent's not going to tap out unless like you're in a tournament setting or something where just, they want to get onto the next round and not deal with this. Right. You know? yeah. yeah. And that's, I guess that's where the question comes in is like, is it something that you really stress about in now changing the dynamic a little bit in a CDH format? Is this something that you really like stress about? Cause I would liken it to like, if you're playing Hepatra and you land Yogmoth and it's got a, like that combo has a nickname. It's called sad nauseum. Uh, Cause as many creatures are out there, you're going to draw cards and uh you know lose a life for each one but this ultimately creates a like a soft lock for creatures on the board you can machine gun creatures down as many, as much life as you have with yogmoth and gain card advantage off of it uh is that fun to play against i don't well like i i don't feel one way or the other like and that's just how i've developed as a player to be like this is what's happening at the table right yeah, now yeah I, I mean I think the real question is, is it effective? If, yeah, like, because that like, is a good a question. Soft lock, a con- First of all, a, con- a conditional soft lock is not a hard lock. Like, And in a four-player right. game, unless you have a hard lock, 
like what's the point of what you're doing you're you know there you are even locking one of your three opponents out let alone all three of them out especially in a you know if it's conditional yeah and like i would say a hard lock is nearly impossible in cdh just because like even if they're because even, even if there's even a lock the stack the stack you know if there's 10 stack pieces on the board there are ways that people are just cutting through all that you know they will they will grind and get card advantage enough or tutor a cyclonic rift to the top and like they will push it right back to your hand they'll push everything right back to your hand and you will sit there and cry and like that's where like that's where my mentality changed you know i've tried to like find my way around cyclonic rift or the cards of the like um throughout my time as a magic player but like ultimately those are great safety valves for good players and for great decks and um you know this isn't to like um discourage uh i guess those like staxy players who want to put a lock on the game there have been times where i've definitely like put the clamps down early and then without being able to generate any sort of card advantage have just sort of like dirtled while the board is locked down and then four players are having a bad time but that is just the circumstance of the game. It doesn't mean that I'm winning. Other players might feel like I'm winning, but I'm sitting there just struggling as much as they are. Uh, like, for example, there was a time when I think we were all playing. I know a guy was definitely in this game, but I I had mauled down to five, and I had a Mana Crypt, a Land, and an Aven Mind Sensor in my hand. Like, And so I was like, you know what? I can keep it. This can keep me in the game. If I draw another land, I'm set. And I, so turn one, land, crypt on guys, because <laughs> guy went next, uh, cracked a fetch land. And in response, I put the mind sensor down and he whiffed. And so now he was without mana at all. And I was just like, perfect. This is going to buy me all the time I need because he was on team or Dargo. And so it goes around the table. Everyone's struggling because they can't tutor for their, you know, they all had fetches. And I go to draw my next card. It's nothing. It's not a land, and it's a card that I can't even play. So I just <laughs> I swing with mind sensor and I pass the turn. <laughs> and I took three damage from the mana crypt. <laughs> but that was that was the situation for like the next four or five turns was how do we fucking get out from underneath this mind sensor so the game can continue? Uh mm. and like it it's it's not that I, I won the game because I, I, I didn't, but uh, it felt like death by a thousand cuts. It felt like um, I'm sitting here with little to no power to change my situation. Um, so fun. Uh, like you said, I don't think anybody like it's uh, like when you're watching Roadhouse and Swayze is presented with the question. Um, do you ever, you know, uh, you know, uh, do you ever win a fight or and he's like, nobody ever wins a fight. And like, that's exactly the way I feel about this whole like death by a thousand cuts conversation is like in this situation, nobody wins. Yes. Technically yeah. someone at the end will be, but well, maybe it draws out, but yeah, I, I mean like that style of deck in CDH, it's uh, yeah, honestly, that's it. I don't get the point of it. There are better ways to play resource denial at like, again, if you want to play like there, you can't, generate asymmetrical advantage on these trade-offs um at value in a four-player game and so if you want to do that type of stuff you really just have to play hard stacks um that is the way to do that in a multiplayer game or just find a deck that's gonna win the game instead yeah and there are a few like there are a few outlying like circumstances where yeah you do get stuck you think you're comfortable on a fetch land and you're denied because someone throws an oppo agent down or someone throws the mind sensor down sure um and this is ultimately why i don't get too upset about it anymore it's just the boat that i'm in is like i could have mulliganed for you know a more aggressive hand or a safer hand or something of the like and uh you know i could have even though i didn't know this was coming i could have at least uh took a safer strategy you know so it, you know it's top deck until i get out of it right the game is always going to keep going on it's just sometimes that game might last two and a half hours so uh yeah i'm uh, I'm, I'm about tapped out on whether or not i would say that 
there are no winners in this situation, but there, there is not, I don't really feel salty about that. How, how would you say, how would you say it? Are you salty? How about this? Yeah. Yeah. About that. If someone were to do that to you. Uh, Like if someone smallpoxed you and you sat there and just dirtled until you lost. I would respect it as a longtime smallpox player. That's what you want. There we go. I feel happy for them. All right. Sweet. That answers the question. It seems like a small victory, but yeah. Yeah. If you feel differently, make sure to let us know. Uh, Yeah. If you think smallpox is not an objectively bad card in CDH, (laughs) let us know. Because it is. It's an objectively bad card. (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) They'll make a better version of it in Modern Horizons 3, I'm sure. All right. Moving on to... Oh, an- can, I add something? can I add something to that? Yeah, yeah, go ahead. It, it is uh, a subjectively bad card in modern. It, like, it was never, it, there was never an era where it was good. I'm sorry. I, I wanted it to be, but even in modern, I, I think it was at best tier two. I think it's a cool card. Like, yeah. It's a great but- card. I love small box. I, lo- I love that strategy, and, but yeah. No, there are definitely, like, cards that have always been faster and better and set themselves up you know, for, to win more effectively. Um, but the next thing on the docket, hopefully the last breath of air that I ever give Thunder Junction. Um, but here we go. The question for you, Ritter is the new Oko. How bad is it? And, uh, let me, if you're unfamiliar, I with the don't new know, Oko, Evan, how bad is it? Uh, it's awful. I'll give you that. Oh, okay. okay. So, uh, we've, this is a mythic from the new set, Outlaws of Thunder Junction. It is two, a blue, and a green for uh, for pl- legendary planeswalker Oko that says, at the beginning of combat on your turn, Oko the ringleader becomes a copy of up to one target creature you control until end of turn, except he has hexproof. You can plus one, draw two cards. If you've committed a crime this turn, discard a card. Otherwise, discard two cards. You can minus one, create a 3-3 three, three green elk creature token. You can minus five. For each other non-land permanent you control, create a token that's a copy of that permanent. So uh, this doesn't do nearly what you'd hope it would do uh, with the precedent that Oko, or at least the design for Oko, uh, has been, you know, <laughs> so far. Uh, but uh, the big thing here is that most of the mythics, or at least most of the planeswalkers that have static abilities like this, they try to design them to uh, fuel themselves, right? So that, that one effect uh, complements the other, and ultimately the design makes sense. So this one has me a little confused, and this is ultimately why I think it's, uh, well, dog shit. But it's it's that static ability that at the beginning of combat on your turn, Oko becomes a copy of up to one target creature. And this is the important part. You control until end of turn, except he has hexproof. The plus one ability says draw two cards if you've committed a crime this turn. And committing a crime is targeting anything your opponents control or anything in their graveyard or targeting them as a player. That is what is committing a crime. So... Uh, otherwise discard you know discard a card otherwise discard two cards so you're not even allowed to gain card advantage uh, or well let's just say it all right oko is not able to commit a crime at all like <laughs> for a ringleader for someone who is planning a heist who is uh the uh yeah who is the leader of a group of outlaws he is unable to commit a crime with his static ability. Uh, so that's why I was saying that it should have been he can become a copy of, of, of up to one target creature full stop until end of turn, except he has hexproof because then this card becomes playable because he can then plus one draw two cards if you've committed a crime this turn. You can actually commit a crime by targeting your opponent's creature and becoming a copy of it. Um, so, well, actually that wouldn't work either because he would become a copy. Does he lose all of, he probably loses all of these abilities alongside that too. So this is such a weird design space and, uh, 
I, I figured that they would have maybe made this a little bit stronger. Maybe it maybe it sees more play in like standard or something like that. But uh, do you have any any thing to share on this Oko? Uh, yeah, I I texted Madge. Uh, Madge is back in the other room, and mm. uh, I I wanted to get Madge's opinion on this, and uh, she she hasn't responded yet. She's she's obviously still reeling. Uh, from that shocking news earlier in the oh, episode. Oh, the, the initial so, announcement, yeah. But I'll let you know if she texts me back about Oko. Sure, 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 sure. Uh, for now, I think yeah. Pite ha- might have something to say. And what's that, Pite? Hey, hey Pite, did I tell you to shut your goddamn robot mouth? <laughs> You're not stealing Ritter's spot, Pite. All right. Yeah, uh, get out of here. Uh, so if you haven't picked up on it, today's uh, episode is more or less some small questions touching on uh, a few things here and there. Uh, I don't want to spend really any more time on this Oko, but what the one thing I will say about the um, about the strategy is that in other formats, discarding two cards right now is disgusting. Um, so like reenact the crime is a really powerful card in standard right now. Ritter, ha- have you seen reenact the crime? I have not. Uh, what's what is going on in standard? Have you been doing any reps on arena? Yeah, unfortunately, you know. What like, are you playing right now? I'm playing this deck. <laughs> We're gonna have to crime. Okay. So it uh, it's the the Sphinx from Karlov Manor reenact the crime and then breach the multiverse, and it's it's pretty disgusting. But uh, yeah, uh, you're playing breach the multiverse in standard. Yeah, it's really good. Um, oh, okay. So spicy. Yeah, it's it reenact the crime is one and three blue, and with how much color fixing there is now in standard has made it pretty relevant. Those uh murders at Karloff Manor uh d- like typed out dual lands, so like the ones that enter the battlefield and surveil contribute heavily to this. But uh if you uh reenact the crime says exile target non land card in a graveyard that was put there from anywhere this turn, copy it, you may cast the copy without paying its mana cost. So um, you basically set yourself up at four mana. There's a couple sagas that allow you to discard a card um, on the on turn, basically on turn four if you time it all correctly. So you just discard Breach the Multiverse, and then all of a sudden each player is milling ten cards. You run one singular Jace, um, and then... Uh, a ton of other like huge things so you, you get you play Atraxa, you play a few other things but you basically get to play both players decks and the best cards from it uh for four mana and the thing is the sphinx um i think it's conspiracy unraveler yeah there it is Conspiracy Unraveler, it is a seven mana Sphinx that you are casting with Reenact the Crime, but it says you may collect Evidence 10 rather than pay the mana cost for spells that you cast. And if you're unfamiliar with collecting evidence, uh, all you have to do is exile cards with mana value and combined uh, equal to 10 from your graveyard. So uh, pretty great when you have Atraxa, a Reenact a Crime, and a few other cards in here. If you happen to mill your second Conspiracy Unraveler, you can exile that and then exile you know, something that's three mana, and then all of a sudden you're casting another Breach the Multiverse and you're going off even harder. So it's it's a pretty cool deck. It just combos off super quickly. But um, yeah, that's standard right now where uh, this new Oko, I get, you know, like maybe... But you already have a lot of static effects that uh, don't really like. Yeah, y- you could have it become a copy of Atraxa, but then it mm. dies immediately because a legend rule. Ah, it's awful. Oko, you piece of dog shit. Anyway, all right. The next topic of conversation. Next. What do we got? Well, we've uh, received a request in our YouTube comment section uh, from a viewer on our uh, our primer section like in our primer profile like i've been doing pant laza and a few other things but uh they requested that we do a video on sign of the ur dragon and so while i'm still working on that i have uh a question for you ritter what Here's, is that well i shared my list with you earlier mm. sign of the ur dragon if you're unfamiliar is wooberg white blue black 
red and green for a legendary creature dragon avatar that is a 4-4 flying that says pay two, search your library for a dragon permanent card and put it into your graveyard. If you do, Scion of the Ur Dragon becomes a copy of that card until end of turn, then shuffle your library. This is a CDH build that focuses on getting your commander out, activating it, and potentially winning the game if that activation resolves. So uh, I, I've, I've sort of looked at a few lists and put something together. And really, the, the question is, can this deck be unique? And I'm having a hard time. Well, I have a, I have a question for you before we get to even asking if it can be unique. Mm -hmm. And that is, you said in your introduction that this is a deck focused on getting your commander out and then doing things with that commander. Yes. What is your plan for getting your commander out? Look at this look at this, look at this crazy casting cost. One of each colored pip of mana. <laughs> yeah. What turn are you what turn are you casting your commander before you even think about going off with this? I mean, the hope would be turn 3, you know, turn like turn 2 if you are if your opponents have been incredibly greedy. Okay. Um, you know, like if you're able are you to land a dock side. Are you playing this deck in Candyland? Right, I mean, that's exactly my. <laughs> that's a great question. That is, that's kind of the difficulty I'm finding here. Is that uh, because you know the most popular five color commanders are Kenrith, which you need white mana to cast, and Najila that you need red mana to cast. Right? Yeah, you're at a significant disadvantage because uh, one, you are not you're not able to really play Jeweled Lotus. You're not really able to like. Uh, yeah. Yeah, Jeweled Lotus is just a lotus petal. <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly, for this. Yeah, it's, it's a $100 lotus petal. Yeah, and I just, like, unless this dies and you have to, like, cast it again, which you might as well just scoop at that point, um, you know, I, I guess, am I playing it in Candyland all the time? That's the way that I imagine a lot of the hands going, you know, like, in, in playtesting this, I've I've seen... You know, like definitely some hands where I'm like, oh, I can, you know, turn one Dockside or I can turn one this. But it doesn't really get me much because I can't really like visualize what my opponents have done with their first turn. Am I going second? Am I going third? You know, blah, 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 blah. So. All right. So so realistically, let's let's say this game just plays out the normal way. Yeah. What are you doing because you're not able to cast your commander cause, your commander because you can't assemble the, the five different color pips of mana? Like, what is the deck doing um, until you're able to actually do it? Like, let's say realistically, it's turn five, and that's if yeah. that's if you curve out into the correct color mana pieces and the correct rocks and whatnot. Turn five, you get your commander. What are you doing those first four turns with this deck? Well, uh, hopefully generating some sort of advantage or stopping my opponent. So, like, that's like really where the interaction suite comes in is like the instance here. I have twenty two, and like playing Pact Negation, Offer You Can't Refuse, Dispel, Mental Misstep, Flusterstorm, Red Elemental Blast, and Pyroblast, uh, Swan Song Silence, uh, Force of Will, Mind Break Trap. You know, like that's that that's my like suite of interaction. Um, just to like kind of strive to get towards that mid game because not only do I need to get to the commander, but I also have to be able to declare an attack with it. Before I can before I can present a win condition, potentially. So there are a couple yeah, other. Yeah, I, I mean, I, I think the conventional wisdom, like we're talking about this as a CDH deck. Yeah. Yeah, I, I mean, the conventional wisdom is that if your commander is difficult to land, uh, that's bad. If your commander cannot be a combo piece or like you know a, enable that whatever from the jump, that's bad. And, like, if you need to get a attack off, like, if you need to pass a turn, because, um, right, this, you know, your commander doesn't have haste, right? Right. Nope. No haste. No haste. If you need to, if you could need to survive a turn cycle with your commander on the board and it's a, hey, your commander comes out and you're going to win the game type commander, that's not going to happen situation. Like, that's bad. Like, there's not, I, I... Yeah. If you love dragons, you should play this commander. If you love dragons. Yeah, but there's only if, the thing is you know, there's only yeah. four dragons in the entire list. And yeah. I've already like started moving some of them around because it's not that the Ur Dragon 
has to absolutely like win through like the attack process, you know, like the attack phase. Like it doesn't have to declare the attack to technically like win the game. There's a few like mm -hmm. other pieces that can like fall to you that allow your okay. you know allow it to go off. But like uh, I, you know if you're so there's a broodlord so line playing, with with spellseeker. Yeah, I see it like listen man like if you're playing uh I again play this commander if you want to play dragons this list that we have here there's four dragons in this list <sighs> two of them I probably wouldn't play in CDH right uh and then the other two one of them only makes sense as a commander and the other one is a combo piece that you can run in uh any black deck Right? Yes. Yeah. Essentially. Right. So hoarding broodlord is there because it wins the game. Like that is that yep. is where we're at with it. And uh, Corvold is there because he's good. Yeah. Like there's just potential yeah, here and, to and, generate. You know, yeah. Infinite treasures. I mean, but if you want to play Corvold, put Corvold in the command zone, and and you can do fun stuff. Yeah. Which Corvold has been presenting like a high conversion rate lately because of the way mm -hmm. that we've ultimately moved like with the pacing of the game. So Corvold, the minus like in the downside of that is, uh, well, you don't, you're not able to include blue in that list and you, you know, have l less of a uh, suite of interaction. So maybe you're encouraged to be more aggressive and, uh, you know, pursue that turbo strategy and that's not our mindset you know mm -hmm. and so like how I, I mean but i mean man if you want to play corvold secret commander that might even kenrith might even be the better commander for that yeah but like reanimation like strategies yeah. and stuff like that yeah I, I think that obviously kenrith is amazing and like sisse is amazing there there are so many like really great five color commanders that are just like on the face far Actually, superior you know what? yeah i and you know what the question you originally asked is like can this deck be unique and i would say the answer is no because looking at this deck list there are two unique cards in here otherwise you're just playing you know five color good stuff and those two unique cards are the two dragons that you ancient. probably wouldn't play yeah. Yeah, Ancient Brass Dragon and Ancient Silver Dragon um, that you probably wouldn't play. Uh, otherwise, like, again, so now you have three bad slots, one of which is your commander, two of which are the dragons that are only in there because of your commander. And otherwise, you're just playing five-color good stuff. So play the better five-color commander at that point. Yeah, and I, I guess, like... And, and open up two more spots for good cards. Yeah, the way, that, like, I guess the way that I mean to, like, ask the question with, can this be unique? Um, the Sign of the Air Dragon's ability is not weak by any means because being able to search your library for any dragon and becoming a copy of it is powerful. Like, I even thought about yeah. playing the Copper Dragon because, well, like, there's a chance to get, like, you know, up to 20 treasures off of that. And so, like, there is, yeah, I, I, you, you know... You mentioned a, a different... You did mention a unique approach when we were talking before the show, though, with Masswood ne Nexus. Yeah, I you know... That seems... That, if you want to go unique, I, I, see, I think that seems good. If you're just playing, like, this commander at face value to tutor out one of four dragons, like, ah... Uh, like yeah, Don't does do it, it does it present enough advantage? Like uh, making contact, nope. yeah, making contact with the silver. Play dragon. dragons approach. Play a more play high powered <laughs> with a lot of like more suboptimal cards in there because you want to play more dragons and do it. But don't like if you're going to play CDH, maybe Maskwood Nexus seems like the line. You know, and I thought here too, like um, I I wanted to swap in and out a few things like uh, old Gnawbone for one is one that you can play uh, alongside like Corvold so you can hit with Old Gnawbone and then the following turn because the thing is is that Sign of the Ear Dragon is instant speed and so that you're able to like at, you could you know set yourself up for a ton of card draw when your opponent is like trying to win the game uh, just by having it become a copy of Corvold and sitting on a few treasures. So like that I can see where there's like flexibility in being able to like respond appropriately to like uh, 
like a wind condition being presented. The uh, the other thing is there's another dragon that I was considering, which is Dragon Lord Dramoka, which is uh, you know it can't be countered, which doesn't matter because that's the big weakness of this card is that it can't trigger any enter the battlefield effects. So it can't like even though Hoarding Broodlord is right there, uh, the thing is is that you are literally just using the search ability for Hoarding Broodlord to throw it into the graveyard so that you can either reanimate it or uh, make contact with the ancient brass dragon and hope that you roll an eight or higher to be able to reanimate that broodlord and then you win the game. So the, obviously there's a few like nuances here, but I can see the potential. Uh, oh, to finish my thought on dragon Lord Dramoka is that uh, it says that opponents can't cast spells during your turn. So it's like, it's like a grand abolisher, uh, but that's kind of where I was like, well, if I played mass squad nexus, since I've already included Magda, in my list, you know, and uh, sort of approach the game in a different, like, treasure-focused, you know, approach. I really wonder, like, how, if if Maskwood Nexus would allow me to, whatever card I decided to turn Signing the Earth Dragon into would help me win the game more effectively. So that's where I'm, like, brainstorming and trying to make it a little bit more unique and fit my personal, like, flavor and that's ultimately why, even though we got the request to like do a, a primer on this deck, I'm having difficulty turning it into something that is unique to the Mock Stars what brand. Did the request uh, have a specific build in mind? No, just that uh, they wanted to okay. see they wanted to see like us build Sign of the Ur Dragon. So I mean, what's what's the other way? Dragon's approach. No, where you could do this. I, I would say you cost yourself too many slots for that because then you lose out on like all that good five color potential where it's like, yeah. you know, you, you lose, you probably lose your brain freeze lines. You probably lose your intuition lines. And that's where this deck can shine is that it stumbles into a lot of things. Um, you yeah, know, like, but, but by playing like a not good five color commander. Yeah. I like, mean, if you want access to five colors, this isn't the commander to do it. No, if you, you want dragons. This is the commander. Yeah, you I gotta have to. Buddy, want the if you dragons. like dragons, I got a commander for you. Yeah, you gotta have to. Want them. You're a dragon. Yeah, and then you know, like even for me, the enchantment package is is weak, and I've you know battling with putting more in. But then you need the color flexibility, so that's why I've included more artifacts, um, you know, and more tutors, and just trying to like give myself a chance uh, to get the commander out to execute the game plan. So. Ultimately, is it uh, like is it unique? It, I find it really hard to make it unique because there are like ultimately you you can only really have four maybe five slots available to for your dragons for like tutoring these dragons out uh, or for like tutoring them up dumping them in the graveyard. So um, the selection is very thin. Where like there is I thought about. Um, God, that bargain dragon from Eldrain that allows you to pay two mana and deal one damage to any target Mm -hmm. because that is like, Mm -hmm. that's a mana sink, right? So that if you're able to generate infinite mana, which there are a few ways, Emil the Blessed and, you know, like some Spellseeker loops, whatever, you can pull that out or you can go through your Underworld Breach like lines and then generate infinite mana through a Dockside like loop and then tutor, you know, that. And it seems like you're you're spending so much time setting up a win line that goes specifically through dragons when you could just be using that time to, to win. Yeah, you're threading a needle that um, has a very small pinhole, and mm-hmm. there's a needle right next to it with a much larger pinhole that would just be way easier to use. Way more effective. Yeah, uh, yeah I... Man, I... <sighs> I don't is is Scion of the Ur Dragon even the best dragon commander? Yet, well, we don't know. I don't know. I probably not. I mean, you know, like Corvold like, is obviously like way not. more I, consistent. I feel like maybe like something like Rocco, where you can just play Secret Commander and just choose the best dragons in that color, might even be a better dragon commander, right? Well, you you would be surprised. You'd think that wow, dragons are a really strong creature type. They're not really that strong of a creature type because they don't exist in like. They exist at the end game, like that tier at, you know, like... You know uh, where they're great? 
battle cruiser. Battle cruiser and high power. They are incredible at battle cruiser. There's some lists that I've seen that include dragon mage, which when it makes contact, each player some discards their hand and draws seven. That the game of commander or the format of commander uh, originated as elder dragon highlander. Is that a? Is that true? Uh, I mean, that's deep in the mists of lore of mm. time. I actually, I'm going to text Madge and see what Madge thinks. You know, it's like Lord of the Rings when they're like, the ring disappeared and it it mm-hmm. became a rumor and then a legend and then a myth. And uh, I think we've, we've gotten to that point where it's a myth now. I'm just kidding. We know the history of the EDH. All right. Ritter, I've got a but very... Yeah, uh- I don't know, man. I, I feel like, sorry, I, I we have uh, failed this person who requested a primer. I will uh, I not mean, give up. You're not going to give up. You're going to keep doing I'm gonna it. Keep, I'm going to make the video. Like, I will make the video, okay. and I just have to, like, find a way. And I think it's good to, like, bring this to the table it's, and bring this to, like, bring this to light. Have you know what? I have a request. I have a request. Uh, you got to th- thread the needle, thread the needle using, uh, what is it? Ember Chod, Thumber Chod, or whatever. Oh my the god! The fat dragon from the Dungeons and Dragon movie. Yeah. At least make it. At, if we're gonna, if we're gonna play a bad commander, at least make it a meme. Well, I've seen, I've seen tournament lists that Thumber Chod has like topped, like made top sixteen before. So I'm not totally counting okay. it out as a like as an option. It's just stronger when it's in the command zone versus being fished out of the deck because it has an ETB trigger. No, I think you gotta do it. I, I think it's sometimes like you know if. If there's a funny answer for a card that you can demonic consultation, you know, or something like that, you got to do it. So in the same way, if there's a funny way to end the game and it runs through Thumberjawed, I think you have to do it. I uh, Sorry, I have to correct myself for the community out there. It's no longer an ETB trigger. It's just an E-trigger. They got rid of the battlefield part on, on text. Oh. Yeah. Mm. Um, all right. Ritter, the next question I have for you. And this will wrap sure. up the show. Uh, oh, yeah. I had post, put up a couple. I was pulling up the page for, like, dragons because I was going to give so many bad examples for, like, the top end of dragon cards <laughs> for the Scion. It's not great. There's just not a lot of cards that do a lot. But uh, now there's, there's always a question. And uh, as teenagers, we like to play this game because we're immature. And we're still exploring what humor is. And so I have a question for you, Ritter. Fuck, marry, kill, or rather, draw, discard, or exile to solitude. Silence, Esper Sentinel, and Grand Abolisher. And the reason I'm asking this question is because I have been thinking about what the best white card in CDH is and trying to create a list. And it ultimately comes down to these three that I can't quite determine to be the best white card in CDH. So, uh, which card would you like to draw? Which card would you like to discard? And which card would you exile the solitude? Because it, uh, well, that's your option. So, what what is the F in this situation? Who uh, equivalent draw, discard, exile? Ooh, let's see. Uh, I think. I think Mary is draw. Like, Mary is, like, the thing that you want to have around, right? Okay. Discard would be the, like, you want the option, but you can... The kill. Yeah, you can get rid of it. <laughs> and the exile to solitude. Oh, wait, no. The, the, the F should be the exile to solitude, because you have the option, but it also provides uh, value in some way. Right? This analogy is too complicated. I'm going to stick with FML. Uh, yeah, the first uh, or FMK. Yeah. Uh, let's go. Let's go. F silence. M grand abolisher. K uh, uh, Esper Sentinel. Yeah. Uh, and my reasoning there is Esper Sentinel uh, pays off less often than you want. Uh, it's great if you land it turn one or turn two. Even then, if you land it to turn two, maybe it's not so great. Uh, M grand abolisher because it can just really. Uh, put a soft lock on a board state for a while while you're trying to win the game. Um, so you want to stick around for a while. And F, uh, because silence, I think, is probably the best white card in CDH. Like, it just does something uh, pretty unique to that color. Happens at instant speed, stops a win con, lets you interact on the stack. Um, it's just, like, a must-include. Whereas, like, even Grand Abolisher, sometimes it's, like, 
I'm 95% sure that I want Grand Abolisher in the list. I'm not 100% sure. Yeah, and I, I guess whenever I'm including white in a list, it's always these three cards that go in. Because, like you said, Esper Sentinel at the beginning of the game is invaluable. It provides so much card advantage. And, like... Oh, I, I mean, if, if you're only playing your games in Candyland, Esper Sentinel... That's, you know that's, that's where I app. live. I live there. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> As for Sentinels, you're F if, if you live in Candyland and yeah. play your games there. No, I, and I'm, I'm not saying that, but like it's always a surefire thing because a late game Esper Sentinel is something that you're going to pitch to a Solitude if you're even playing Solitude. But <clears throat> you're going to pitch it to Survival of the Fittest. You know, it's, it's gone. It's no longer valuable. The odds of you drawing a card are slim. And that is only if your opponent is like counting their mana very closely and they can't you know, like they, they just aren't able to like fiddle with that and, and pay for it. So um, to their detriment, I would say that you're pretty much right on the money, like as far as how I feel. And this is why I ultimately have like feelings one way or the other is because Grand Abolisher presents or like Grand Abolisher hitting the battlefield. It says this person is going to win the game or they're going to attempt to win the game. There are times when it sits unrecognized and that is insane to me because it's happened to me and I feel like an idiot. Uh, but like there are times when a grand abolisher will sit there for multiple turns and then suddenly someone will present a win condition and you're like, Oh, game's over. Yeah. Like, yeah, buddy. The thing about the grand abolisher is that for the person whose board it's on, it doesn't do nothing to them. It doesn't stop. Nothing doesn't stop right. them from doing anything. <laughs> yeah. Like not on like, anybody I, else's I mean, turn or that, anything. That, like that. is something like, that everyone knows. You know, everyone knows what the card re reads, but it it almost even seasoned players like it catches you off guard. Like, right, that is the specific loophole that exists on this card for the for this version of this effect for this person. And it it's only been in the last like two years that we've even seen answers to Grand Abolisher with like Baseju and Ottawara mm -hmm. where like someone goes for if someone goes for their uh, underworld breach line with a Grand Abolisher like it's not going to protect against that that uh, Baseju blowing up the underworld breach you know it's not going to protect against Ottawara bouncing it to let, so that your opponents can interact and that's where you could say that it has gotten like it took a little bit of a hit but um, it, not not much at all because the odds of your opponents like having those cards is still very very slim. So like Grand Abolisher, oftentimes, like I said, flies under the radar. But once it you become aware of it, it's often it's just too late. I think that if it goes on the stack and it resolves, it's too late a lot of the time. And uh, Esper Sentinel provides that like crucial card draw. Like it's I'm I'm keeping a hand if I have white mana and Esper Sentinel to start the game like a lot of the time so um this yeah, is where I, I mean it's it's the best card in white if you land it turn one yeah and so and then yeah. so it's uh, for me it's an automatic like include for anything like that and then grand abolisher just like if you're running any sort of combo if you're not winning through combat damage uh well even if you are winning through combat damage i feel like uh, like it does present value to you as well so, yeah, Silence, but like you said, Silence, for me, is probably the best card in white, just because it offers you that Grand Abolisher effect in your upkeep. Like, you can cast it, fire it off, and just let the table know, like, burn your interaction here, otherwise I am going to just win unabated, and then it also stops your opponents from winning on other turns as well. So, um, yeah, I think, uh, I think I agree with your analysis there. Good work, Ritter. Your your uh, FM was it FMK? I I, I think that's what we settled on. Yeah, yeah. Is uh yeah yeah your judgment is is accurate. It's, it's uh, well founded. But that's it. I think I'm uh I think I'm tapped out for today, Ritter. I'm I'm ready to just let my mana fizzle. Ah, uh, there we go. There. Well, you got you got the magic uh, analogy back in, so it worked out trying to work on it you know I'm just trying to yeah. be that be that personality that everyone expects me to be hold myself to that pressure every single day oh God. hey i have an update from madge yeah yeah uh, yeah 
Yeah, uh, she died. Oh. Nope. She's dead. Oh. Yep. Wow. Is that like like Happy Gilmore levels of like dead where, you know, oh, she fell off a cliff or. Um, yeah. No, she um, she jumped through. Oh, uh, right. Remember, she had jumped through jumped that, window. that window. Yeah. Um, with the Looney Tunes thing. And, uh, you know, I, I kept texting her. And when she didn't get get a response back, I, I should have known something. But, yeah, no, she's she's pretty dead. Oh, she's like all the way dead. 100% oh, wow. Dead. Wow. Yeah. R.I.P. Madge. Yeah. Yeah. That was that was real glass uh, <laughs> that she jumped through. That was real ground. That'll mess you up pretty, yeah. That'll mess you pretty up. And I'm on the third floor. So, uh, yeah. Yeah. I, like, I, I guess we'll never know what she thought about the new Oko. Yeah. It's so sad, well, actually. Mm. Like, just like not knowing what Madge thought about New Oko. Well, if, well, now that we won't be able to get Madge's opinion, we'll be able to get our listeners' opinion uh, when they leave a comment in, on the, you know, on YouTube, on the video. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. That, that's, it, a, that's a yeah, consolation. Please comment below the video what you think Madge would have thought of New Oko. <laughs> Madge's, uh, uh, time here on the show was was brief but uh you know like a the white dwarf star burned bright oh absolutely beautiful beautiful yes. words evan thank you all right this has been the mock stars podcast if you enjoyed the show uh, make sure you support us by going to youtube if you'd like to support us i should say go to youtube hit that like subscribe and ring that bell for more notifications you can also find us on our discord server where you can join the community and contribute to these conversations uh, you can also support us on patreon by becoming an official pepperhead you can uh, gain one free entry into this week's giveaway which is the dan frazier arcane signet valued at about 17 dollars and because that uh isn't quite enough i figured i would toss in a one of one mock stars can cap from cora labs as well you can also become a cherry vanilla pepperhead like uwp quirt and that will gain you two free entries into every single giveaway that we do doubling your chances to win if you'd like a shot at the arcane signets you can also follow us on instagram and comment on the post that i put up the day this episode comes out um and uh pretty pretty low bar of entry there just make sure you follow the directions uh, let's make it so follow us on Instagram, like the post, and leave a comment to enter to win this Dan Frazier Arcane Signet and the Core Labs Can Cap. All right, Ritter, let's get the heck out of here. Let's go. Remember, this is the number one podcast for Magic the Gathering and Dr. Pepper, the home of the mid-range mindset. And uh, Willie sent us peeps. Oh, yes. Thank you. Proof! Proof! Willie sent us peeps! They're right here! I got them in my hands! Thank you so much, Willie. They're not Dr. Pepper peeps, so I'm only slightly disappointed. Um, but this is, uh, it's beautiful. Um, but the, uh, the package came with a warning. It says, this is a set. Do not separate. So I can't open them because the label says not to. Um, well, no. If you open them, you just have to eat all of them, so they're not separated. Because they're a set. That, yeah, Ritter. You, that's why you're the smartest mock star. All right, peace. I'm getting out of here. See you. Bye.